Greetings, every, greetings everyone and welcome to another Eye on Africa. My name is Awasar. I'm Assistant Director for Academic Affairs at the African Studies Center, Michigan State University. I'm very delighted today to have two very distinguished guests who are gonna share their research with us. Uh, we have for today, Dr. Ursula Reed and Dr. Lily Povey. Uh, Ursula Reed is a research associate in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College, London, UK. She obtained her PhD in anthropology from University College, London. Since 2005, she has conducted extensive ethno ethnographic research in Ghana focusing on the impact of mental illness on family life, uh, help, help seeking and moral and ethical dilemmas around care and consent, as well as the emergence of global mental health and rights-based approaches, approaches to mental health. She is currently leading several research projects in Ghana, exploring community inclusion for people with mental health conditions collaborations between mental health workers and traditional and faith healers, and the potential of participatory arts for mental health advocacy and activism. So we're very delighted to have you, Dr. Ursula. And Dr. Lily Pobi is a research fellow in the Regional Institute for Population Studies at the University of Ghana, Legon. She holds a PhD in psychology from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Her research activities over the years have focused on improving access to mental health care in Ghana and understanding cultural and religious perspectives on mental health. Her work has included examining indigenous mental health care practices and identifying pathways for achieving integrated care within resource limited context. Lily is currently involved in several projects on mental health in Ghana including use, using visual methods to understand how health workers collaborate with healers to minimize human rights abuses in traditional healing centers, as well as using participatory arts to initiate conversations about mental health for advocacy and change in Ghana. So we are very grateful to have two very distinguished uh, researchers sharing today with us. And I pass the floor to Ursula. Thank you very much, Awa. Um, and um, I'm very privileged to be here with, with Lily. Um, and um, thank you everybody for, for, for coming along. I believe we have um, some, of the, uh, some of our friends from Ghana here. So I'd like to say especially warm welcome to them. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so, okay. Okay, so, so I'm going to talk, um, start by talking a little bit about um, the in interdependence of human rights in mental health in Ghana and why um, breaking the chains is, in itself is, is not enough. So, um, in February last year, um, The Guardian, which is a British newspaper, published an article which was titled The Scandal of Ghana's Shackled Sick. And it was accompanied by a number of very carefully composed portraits depicting people chained to trees or locked behind iron grills, often alone. The journalist and photographer were accompanying Human Rights Watch on a research trip to Ghana, the results of which were included in this report, Living in Chains, which documents the shackling of people with mental health conditions in homes, healing centers and hospitals, predominantly in Ghana and Asia. Such reports on the chaining of people with mental health conditions in countries like Ghana have become ubiquitous over the years. And an earlier report in 2012 by Human Rights Watch depicted chaining and other human rights abuses in prayer camps, shrines and hospitals and was widely deployed to support calls for investment and research. These images are designed to provoke shock and outrage and establish a moral imperative for action. 
Breaking the chains has thus attained symbolic weight in human rights campaigns on mental health in countries like Ghana. The same year in which Human Rights Watch published their first report on the issue, Ghana passed a new Mental Health Act, Act 846, which was widely praised by the World Health Organization as a landmark in rights-based mental health reform. The law forbids the use of mechanical restraints and mandates the establishment of visiting committees to regulate the activities of traditional and faith healers and ensure that the rights of persons with mental illness are protected. In 2017, the Mental Health Authority, which runs mental health services in Ghana, conducted an exercise against human rights violations of the mentally ill in prayer camps in which several people were freed from chains. The performative theatre of this event made visible attempts to protect the human rights of persons with mental illness by removing the chains and setting them free. Um, but what is freedom and to what extent can breaking the chains be said to render people living with mental health conditions truly free? The history of psychiatry shows that too often chains can be replaced by other forms of unfreedom, coercion and restraint. Ghana's Mental Health Act, in common with the majority of mental health legislation around the world, still permits the use of some form of restraint where there is imminent danger to the patient or others. Persons released from chains in the exercise that I mentioned above were sent to psychiatric hospital where sedating drugs are routinely administered and conditions are unsanitary and unsafe. Indeed, tranquilization or chemical restraint, though commonly given without consent, is framed as a humane alternative to chaining. Furthermore, our research shows that in Ghana, the use of chains is often the last resort of families struggling to provide care with limited resources and few supports. Where attention has focused on chaining, particularly by traditional and faith healers, this can distract from other human rights violations, such as exclusion from work, family and community, and the neglect of mental health within so health and social care. The emphasis is often on individual stigmatizing behavior and harmful cultural practices, rather than on the ways in which discrimination is embedded into economic, social and political structures, structures, and that includes the ways in which healthcare is delivered and funded. In this presentation, we're going to draw on some research exploring human rights and mental health in Ghana, which I and my colleagues have been conducting over the course of the last couple of decades. This has included projects looking at the emergence of human rights as part of the growing field of global mental health, barriers and facilitate facilitators to realisation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD, in particular the right to live independently in the community, and how mental health workers partner with traditional and faith healers to protect human rights and improve care. And we're going to use examples from this last project, which Lily um, and I are working together on, which we've, which we've called Together for Mental Health. Um, and I'm going to use these examples to illustrate the ways in which human rights violations operate on multiple levels, which go beyond individual experiences of deprivation of liberty and abuse to forms of discrimination within communities and health and social care structures. It's these latter which are often much more difficult to identify and address, since unlike the hypervisibility of chains, they're often occluded, ingrained within social and cultural norms and ideals and the historical organization and funding of health and social services. At the same time, we're going to show how mental health workers work with families and communities to go beyond breaking the chains and develop social interventions which seek to restore dignity, the dignity and self-worth of people living with stigmatized conditions. Sorry, I moved on to this slide a little bit early. So I wanted to talk about the interdependence of human rights, which is a cent central principle of um, of, um, of, of, of human rights uh, 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 declarations and legislation. A principle of the UN Declaration of Human Rights is that all human rights are in, indivisible and interdependent. One set of rights can't be enjoyed fully without the other. In development as freedom, Amartya Sen argues that freedoms are mutually reinforcing. What people can achieve is influenced by economic opportunities, political liberties, social powers, and the enabling conditions of health, education and equal opportunities for all. Freedoms are entwined with civil, political, economic and cultural entitlements. The interdependence of human rights is central to the approach to the UNCRPD, which has been ratified by Ghana and many states in the African region. 
In the CRPD, civil and political rights are fully integrated with social, economic and cultural rights. For people with disabilities, and that includes mental health conditions, rights to work and a family life, are thus given equal status with the right to freedom from coercion and involuntary treatment. Article 19 commits its signatories to take effective measures to ensure full inclusion and participation in the community for people with disabilities. Dianius Porus, who's the former UN Rap Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, has cautioned that too often global mental health campaigns narrowly frame the right to health within biomedical terms. This then leads to a focus on increasing access to mental health services as the answer to human rights violations. From this perspective, expanding mental health services and educating the population on the medical model of mental health will lead to a reduction in the use of traditional and faith healers and mechanical restraint. And in, indeed on this now, Nearly 2,000 community-based mental health workers employed by Ghana Health Service compared to less than 200 when I began research in Ghana 15 years ago. However, mental health remains very low status within healthcare generally. Um, sorry, um, the shrinking of public um, healthcare in Ghana as a consequence of global poly policies of neoliberal disinvestment, structural adjustment and the marketization of health means mental health must compete for priority within a struggling healthcare system, even more so in the era of COVID-19. So sorry, I was got to move my slides on. This is the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which commits itself to this notion of the interdependence and indivisibility of rights. And this is Article 19, which is about the right to live independently and in the community, which is a way of enacting these interdependent rights. And uh, this slide is very illustrative of the kind of discrepancy, discrepancy between physical and mental health care uh, in, in Ghana, as in many countries. So on the left is the psychiatric hospital, which was built in 1906 under the colonial government and hasn't really much changed since then in terms of the actual structure of the buildings. And then on the right is the regional hospital in Accra, which was completed a couple of years ago and is very much, as you can see, at the kind of cutting edge of at least of architecture and, um, and is a leading health institution in the country. And these two hospitals are just uh, a few minutes apart on the same road in the capital. Um, as these, as these pictures show colonial legacies continue to shape the organization of mental health care. This psychiatric hospital on the left dates back to the early years of the 20th century and was constructed more as a place for confinement than care. The primary function of the institution was to remove unsightly vagrants from the street and detain those deemed a suitable subject for confinement due to violent or destructive behavior. This link between homelessness, violence and mental health remains to the present day and the former colonial asylum, alongside two other psychiatric, psychiatric hospitals in the country, continue to absorb the bulk of mental health funding. Although Ghana was an early adopter of community mental health care in the 1970s, this was initially on a very limited scale. So the expansion of mental health care in recent years has brought mental health care to many, including people living in northern parts of the country, where previously ac accessing psychiatric treatment involved long journeys to the south. However, whilst the number of workers in community mental health care has increased, this has not been matched with funding. There's no ring fence budget for community mental health and essential supplies such as medication and transport to visit rural communities are scarce. Mental health workers recount stories of struggling to be given equal status with other health workers for office space, transport, stationary supplies, and even simple respect. They are, they complain, treated as mad themselves. The stigma applied to their patients is extended to them. So nurses will say that they're, they're referred to as, as mad nurses. However, in discussions with people with lived experience of mental health conditions and their families in Ghana, Ghana, it's clear that it's not enough to be able to receive mental health services without opportunities and support to earn a livelihood, to have a safe and secure place to live and to be included within family and community life, as the CRPD describes. Yet within mental health services, there's very limited support to meet human needs beyond the biomedical, support to earn a livelihood, 
for social inclusion and safe accommodation is delegated to families, uh, NGOs, charities, Good Samaritans and religious institutions. Indeed, arguably one of the primary functions of prayer camps is to provide food, shelter and companionship for those who might otherwise be street homeless or ostracised within communities. There are very few state funded social protection schemes available to people with mental health conditions. One is um, the common cut fund, a proportion of the common fund, which is assigned to local government structures for people with disabilities. And the other is the Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty, LEAP, uh, which is um, for the most destitute. But neither of these are very easy to access, particularly for the most disadvantaged. And people with mental health conditions are not commonly recognised within perceptions of, of what, what the disabled or disabled people are. District assemblies were reported to divert the funds for other purposes, mirroring the low status of mental health elsewhere. Thus, for those who are released from chains, this marks the beginning rather than the end of the journey to the realization of rights and freedoms. Too often, families circulate between healers and mental health services, searching for a cure, whilst the underlying determinants of mental health, poverty, social exclusion and discrimination remain unaddressed. The person released from chains may return to his family, but be isolated and unable to work or join in the flow of family and community life. In the absence of funding and formal interventions and confronted by the desperate poverty of many of their patients, some mental health workers dig deep to meet social needs as best they can, providing support for people to start small enterprises such as trading or farming and encouraging families to, and communities to include the person. And so um, I want to end um, just with a, a quote from Regina Ali, who very sadly, sorry, passed away um, just earlier this year. And she said, we needed a motorbike to go out, but there was no means. We write to the administration to help us with means. If they even allow and send you out, they're not going to come back for you. You will know how to come back. So she means she, you'll have to find your own way back from whatever, wherever you've uh, been taken to do your service. So we were there with that gradual, gradual, until Mehoso, which is a NGO, gave us a motorbike. And when that motorbike came, nobody to fuel. The hospital was not funding, was not giving us fuel. I will either have buy fuel, George, another nurse, will have to maybe buy Modica, which is an antipsychotic, and then we were on the field. And the, day, the days that I don't have, George will buy fuel and we will go. And that was the way that um, uh, Madame Regina attempted to overcome some of the challenges they faced. So I'm going to show a short flip, clip of the film, which, um, was um, directed by Erminia Colucci, who's the PI of Bar Together for Mental Health Study. And, um, and then um, Lily's going to flesh out some of that, um, that footage. So if you just bear with me one moment, because I'm going to um, share a, another screen. This morning, uh, the kids were finishing to one of her uh, clients. He found her the first time he saw her. She was working on the street, big kid, and then he took her from there. We went to her to this day, but we got to know that where she's sleeping was not in other conditions. We were lying on the floor, sometimes time to get her some uh, sack and then sleep on it. So we decided to go around and then appeal to people for her to support us. So we went around and then people did this and donations, gave us a new clothes and new mattress, as well as a new first place. So we came here this morning and then one started after this. There's no place for her. And where they have is a pack more of stove. And we cannot ask the family to convey all the assets outside too. So what we're going to do is just um, agree, the family agree that, okay, you're going to divide the room for two, where they will pack all those things to one side, and to be occupied in another one for the meantime, whilst we try to start out with the family, have a permanent place for her to sleep. She's now on medication, she took her medication, 
and uh, the one the one the, uh, one I like about her is she's very innovative. For the first time you found her, although she was naked, but she was trying to do something for herself. And her issue of self to others to know that um, whenever someone is in this situation, the person should not be neglected. The friend has done well because uh, she lost two families. I went to the maternal side and paternal side. We went to the maternal side and nothing good came out of the paternal side. But we came to the paternal side, they showed interest. And before she doesn't stay here, but we too, since she belongs to them, they found a way of assisting. And that's why that woman was given. So before she was not even sleeping in the room, she just room on the street. She would go because as a vegan, naked, all the distraction, people were trying to even hurt her, chasing her with capillaries and transforms because she has been causing a lot of depression. And with the help of this brother here, she was the only person in the family that she listened to. So she did a lot. We all the time people see her for she go around, search for her for the medication. But after you are talking, she's on medication. And it's all these signs that you observe at the initial stage, they are no more. And as you talk, uh, it's like now she's starting to learn in trading and she's doing some signs some topics and others, which I think we can do much to support her. It's like that's where she has interest. So the best thing and the most basic necessity she needs now is to have a place to sit and then at least a convenient place. That's why we came here this morning with the master. I want to find a place for her before the secondary master. We come and support the business that she's doing. So this one, that's what we are here to do. In the family, they are all involving themselves in the cleaning of the room. And then uh, we are trying to make sure things go on well for her. I don't know how it is. 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 I don't know how you <laughs> I told you, come home because I said, I have to say, I told you, come home. I told you, 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 I told you know, I think that you have to be a have a And just what you're not free, what you're not here, what you're not a fan. I'm not for whom you said, I'm not for the dinner. But I'm not for the chair, said, it's maybe quiet. I'm not for the book. I am how I am. I am for the other day. I'm not for the other day. I'm not for the other day. I'm not for the other day. And <laughs> <laughs> I can't go with the amount. The 
Kalau di Jawa sih kan, saya ada pasukan. Amal. So, um, so uh, yeah, so now I'm going to hand over to Lily. All right, thank you, Ursula. I'm going to give a bit of background about the study and also about the, um, the unique case of ATA as we saw and, and use that as a bit of a discussion for the points that we are trying to make, but also maybe give a little bit of an update on where things stand now since we last saw her. So I'm just going to share my screen. I have a few slides to show. Okay, so uh, by way of background, um, the, the region that we worked in was the Bunu East um, region of Ghana. And that's where we conducted field work between April and June of 2019, um, looking at how, observing how mental health workers in two, re two districts in the region carry out community work. So we observed as they engaged with healers and with families and local leaders in their care work. The two case examples that I'll be sharing um, in a moment are drawn from the work of the team of mental health workers in the Inkranza South District. And I have here a little map to show for those who are unaware of, of, of um, where the Bunu East region is. It is in the center, the middle belt of Ghana and where the, rot, the, the red dot is, is where, the, um, in Kranza's, um, where in Kranza is as a town. So we followed the, the mental health workers in that region um, and particularly in Nkranza South District. Now the Nkranza South District has 13 mental health workers um, serving a population of over over a hundred thousand people, the the district is a, it's approximately a hundred thousand. Sorry, it's approximately one thousand square kilometers all around. So these thirteen um, workers, mental health workers, have distributed themselves within the communities in order to be accessible to as many of them as possible. Most of the communities within the district are rural communities, and, and many of them are quite poor communities. So, so sometimes um, access is, is quite difficult. Access to um, reaching those communities in order to do community health work is quite difficult. As Ursula shared from um, Sister Regina's quote, they needed support to go to some of these communities because they were not very accessible generally in some cases. Um, the predominant activity there is agriculture. And so most of the towns in, within that district, we can describe them as market towns. You'll find lots of places where things are being sold. So the particular mental health team in the district was set up in 2013 by Sister Regina, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year. Um, she, had, she, she was a community mental health officer and she had experience in community health work. And so she really got the, the whole um, team going. She did lots of training for the mental health nurses that were under her tutelage and helped them to, to understand what the community work would entail beyond what it was expected to be, some of the realities of what they were expected to do. And so their work ha has often included not just treatment and case finding, or even not just follow up care, but also advocacy and outreach and, and education in a, lot of in, in a lot of cases. So in the case examples that I'm going to be talking about now, we would look at some of the highlights of the work that they do. 
and the implications of those things. So these are some of the, and these are the two health centers where the, the two case, cases that I'm going to be discussing, um, where the, the mental health workers are based within these community health centers. They are, they are primary health care centers. And therefore, as Ursula discussed, the mental health teams often have to compete for resources with their other teams. We, we found an interesting flyer an interesting billboard in one of the health centers where you see all these campaigns, the different campaigns that are going on, and it shows that there's the, the work of the, the activities of the psychiatric unit at the bottom here, but it also shows things like yellow fever vaccination and measles vaccination and things like that. So these activities, uh, activities that are going on within the, those community health centers and the mental health teams have to work within those structures as well in order to provide supportive care for their, their clients. So I'll start to talk by talking about our young lady here whom we have called Ama. Ama is not her actual name, but we have um, given her a pseudonym and protected her identity for reasons of privacy. So in May of 2019, we accompanied as they visited the home of 17 year old Ama who is a young girl that they had been treating for about a year and a half. They had um, first come across her in the year 2018 when they had heard um, from some community members that she was wandering the streets naked and unkempt and being mistreated by members of the community because of her behavior, as George explained in the film that we just watched. So by asking around, they were able to trace her family and found that she was the daughter of a previous patient of theirs. Her mother had also been a patient of theirs in the past, but she had unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Um, but even when she was alive, Amma's mother was also on the streets um, because she had been rejected by her maternal family when she started showing symptoms of mental illness. And therefore, after her death, and since her father had also passed away a few years earlier, Amma had been left to her own fate and had been found roaming around in the streets very unwell until the team stepped in to intervene. So they, they began treating her and um, started to look for ways that they could place her, places where they could house her. They were unfortunately um, able to trace her paternal family um, and they agreed to take her in. Now, this was significant because um, according to the account family system, children belong to and, and they derive their identity through the maternal line. And therefore maternal, the maternal family was expected to take responsibility for the children in this case. Um, but because of their rejection of Amma, the paternal family had agreed to take her in. Now, this kind of situation illustrates the additional mediational roles that um, often the community mental health workers need to play. Um, Ursula has written a, a little bit about these kinds of things and, and she highlights the, the precarity of family care and particularly when it is in conditions of poverty, it shows how the ideals of having a traditional extended family system sometimes cannot be met when they are trying to navigate the challenges of living with a loved one with a severe um, chronic illness. So for instance, George said that in the clip, he said that they got to know that where she was sleeping was not all that conducive. Even though the family had agreed to take her in, they were not able to provide her with a space that was conducive for her to be able to settle well, for her to feel comfortable and to be able to actually manage and, and care for herself. The, the, um, George identified that sometimes she would sleep on the bare floor or on sacks. This also shows in a way how the acceptance by the paternal family may, may perhaps have been in, in some senses of just a perfunctory acceptance because to a large extent, she was left on her own with very little support and care. So in the absence of actual family support, even for basic needs, such as bedding and clothing, it often takes the involvement of health workers, such as the team that we were working with, to meet the needs of people with mental health problems and to advocate for a recognition of their rights as equals. 
through personal fundraising and by involving local philanthropists and community leaders. So the healthcare workers have to find creative ways of maximizing community resources in order to meet the needs of their clients. So they, they go around and do and source for donations and look for ways in which they can intervene in the situation of the, the clients that they're treating as part of the care model that they use. One other thing that the team discovered was that, as George said, she was very resourceful. She was very resourceful and interested in doing a trade in order to support herself. So once she was in recovery, they were able to support her to expand her small business of selling candy and gum and biscuits on a tray. And that is a picture to the left here where she had, um, this is a fairly recent picture where she had started to expand the business that she was doing. Initially, it started with just one or two bottles in her tray at the bottom here, but now she had included it, with, she had expanded it to include some other things. <clears throat> then a further problem was noticed. Although she was working hard to provide for herself, sometimes what she earned was stolen because she was unable to look after her resources well enough to prevent that at that time. So the team further went on to support her through raising funds personally and within their networks. They supported her to open an account at a local credit union. And that is the picture on the right where George went with her and supported her to, as she opened up an account with a local credit union as a way of safeguarding her money and in addition, they, they made moves to start advocating for her to receive support from the disability fund of the, the local assembly, the local district assembly. But unfortunately, despite their efforts, she was not approved for support for the disability fund support due to a lack of responses support from her family. And the way in which the applications for support are structured, you need to have an advocate from within your family to be able to speak on your behalf. Now, while understandably the limited available resources must be distributed carefully, Amma's experience illustrates how such social protection programs may inadvertently discriminate against people who are the most vulnerable in society. Amma did not have family who was able to speak on her behalf when she needed that to, and therefore was not able to access the funds at that time. So the extent of community mental health workers advocacy role with regard to institutional support is, is, is sometimes limited. Although the Nkwanza team had good support from the district director for health who supported the activities that they did whenever they went to him, within a context of little to no external structural support for people like Ama, the mental health workers are often the ones who have to form community alliances in order to support their patients. They have to look beyond the structures, the existing struct institutional structures in order to support their patients. And when there's an absence of family support or support for employment, when there's an inadequate supply of medication and other structural deficits, then it makes um, people living with mental health problems particularly vulnerable as we were able to see in this um, example. So that was one of the case examples that we shared from the video that you watched. But we also have another one, another case example, who's, whom we haven't shown in a video, but this was the story of Malik, who is another beneficiary of the support that community mental health workers provide in the Nkranza district. Specifically, he was in the Bonsu um, mental health facility. And in this picture, the, the the young man sitting next to them, Liberty, is one of the community mental health nurses. Malik became unwell when he was about 14 years of age. His father took him to several prayer camps and traditional shrines, sometimes for months at a time. And he had been to the psychiatric facility in Ankafor, which is in the southern part of the country. Um, in the past, he had been there in the past, and, but upon discharge, when he went home and he relapsed, he became increasingly more disruptive, resulting in his father feeling that he had no option but to shackle him to a tree. This is a picture that um, was shared by one of the nurses when they found Malik at the time that he had been shackled to the tree. His father says that when the illness comes, he doesn't sleep. 
He roams about and destroys people's things. People complained a lot. So I made a shackle and put it on his hands. I put it on his hands and his feet. Even when I go close to him, he fights me. He doesn't allow me to get close. In fact, the other day, he hit the side of my eye with a stone. Now, from previous experience at a prayer camp where Malik had started to self-harm, in fact, he had cut his genitals in an attempt to end his life, his father was worried about removing him from the chains because he feared that he would harm himself. And in his own words, he said, I handled him that way for some time until this man came and took over. Now, this man he is referring to is Liberty, who was the nurse assigned to that community at the time. Liberty had met Malik a few years before while taking a course at the psychiatric hospital at the time when Malik was detained there. When he was posted to the community health center, he followed up and was able to trace Malik to his home. In fact, such commitment to care for a person who was commonly dismissed by people as mad and disruptive appeared to make a very meaningful impression on his father. The father said to us, it really shocked me that, I, that he came here and recognized that he had seen him at Ankafo. It was a long time ago, let's say about five years ago, but he was able to recognize him and come and take care of him. It amazes me. So these kinds of words show that the, the, the care, the extra efforts that were made in terms of the care and the support that um, these mental health nurses provided for the persons within the community was very much appreciated and it made a significant in, influence. Now through Liberty, whom we must say has been very aptly named and through his intervention, Malik was liberated from the chains and slowly we started to see him recover. One of the things that Malik um, found really useful in his own words was that Liberty's kind of treatment, the way he approaches his care and treatment was to gently ca cajole him, which is what was different from what he had experienced in the past. He appreciated Liberty's gentle manner and, and the ways in which he supported him. Currently, Malik is able to work as he has been employed in his brother's cashew business, <clears throat> where he currently packs cashew nuts for export. And this affords him the opportunity to have a meaningful role in the community. But despite this role, the family is still faced with difficulties in terms of medication supply. Although medication is meant to be free for mental health care, there's often very little or no supply of government provided medication due to, as Esla has said in already, inadequate funding a lot of the time. So as is often the case for their poorer patients, the mental health team usually feels obliged to meet the cost. And therefore, once again, we saw them fundraising and do making donations for the continued care of Malik. From his father's um, description, for instance, he says he brings Malik medicine, medication, sorry. There is no money involved. If I say, he takes money from us, then I am lying. We don't give him any money, but he buys it with his own money. He has mercy on us because now I am an old man. I don't have any money. Without such interventions, there's a high risk of relapse for patients like Malik and consequently a likely return to the chains because the parents usually find that a last resort to what their children or their loved ones are experiencing. This narrative again illustrates the interdependence of human rights issues in mental health. The right to freedom from restraints cannot exist without the right to appropriate health care, including access to needed medication. For these nurses who operate within a system of very little support for community work, care sometimes requires the use of their own meager personal income to assist patients. So it often also includes forming alliances as a way of supporting the patients. And these alliances are often with respected members of the community who try to advocate for opportunities. When by associating with such people, um, they are able to show the community that persons with, um, living with mental health issues can be afforded opportunities for gainful employment. We will show a little clip of one of such philanthropists who works with the team in Nkranza and, and employs persons living with mental illness from time to time as a way of showing them support. 
Um, he, he's, I have a quote here from him which, where he says, such people have been rejected. No one cares about them. It helps the community to realize that the mental health workers are working beyond what they are mandated to do because there are many in the community who treat people with mental illnesses as outcasts. They are not useful to anyone. But when they see us drawing close to such people in this way, it makes them realize that they are also worthy. So these are the words of a philanthropist. They call him Ask God, that the mental health workers partnered with, and he provides support and, and, and sometimes um, employment for persons within those communities. Such interventions and partnerships, as has been shown by George and his team, are powerful models of what constitutes good care and serves as a means of advocating for the inclusion of people with mental health conditions as equal human beings with rights to shelter, to food and work, to companionship, dignity, to care. Their work goes beyond the mandate of offering medication and recognizes the importance of bringing families and community members on board in order to promote the rights of persons living with mental health conditions and for such interventions to become more embedded and sustainable within the healthcare structure. So at this point, I would hand over to Ursula to show the bits about the philanthropist involvement, and then we will come back to conclude. Hello, Ursula. You are muted. Thank you, Lily. Can you can you see the film, or you are saying something else? We can see it, but we can hear it. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm just making sure you can see it. Okay. I mean, we can a beer. So, more, you see, to a cracker, no jay, we know. You need to be employed, you know, if I be my juma, or my yajuma, no, I brand your back home. No, 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 a branch of Akoso, so if any, and also of a can and a Huana, yeah, yeah, interlocking block. And also, so, yeah, 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 Say when your time are more, more. In fact, when you many more money, you know, more you may earn it. Now, most of because of addiction, you know, or money you hold, then Papa, or more poor, you know, no. Yeah, Mama Regina, no, or more you may not, or more you know. And of course, I'm planning to say, me who say, or more you know, community no more. More you know, me probably no more say, it's just me. I can't even hold money a boy. It's an say, do you have more car? Or more you know, more say, I just may afford. Ni entra meka sana se se ubi ewo ajini boka iaria na se mama Regina ana Mr George ekoa omu ni se nejuma no oye ne mu mu hulu yenya yenye se ajuma ni bina omu hulu yewa omu ge tume se ampasa eye mwa anka sanka sa ne ni panu hiya mwa yebwa inti ema ni hulu se sometimes kwa omu kwa omu de moto moto ni yeso ni yesi Moto ni sisi biwa wa ni pado duwa wa sio moko na nige kwa wengine dibi wa na mede ni pat ni peke pui ni eno mimi na ako e sa e bwa ma community ni kuhusu se omu ye juma na bro senior e sa omu yeso iko community no ni biwa wa omu timi e yi ni pado bi ana juu na makato chini ni mimi ni bi ya nenso so omu kuhusu se ye ye tu ana money e costa ni pana so wasa kwa na sowa e mo omu kuhusu se sa ni pana ni mimi ya because Omu nusu ni omu kuna nane sani ya yeye yana no, iti mi kwa maji ni sisi zoma, omu di mani ba ni pana ahoroso, inti eno kaho pana nana me 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 ni jibu sisi tembi ya me ni mama rujana ne, ita George ibi tu sana mano, na abu ame iti mi ni pana pi. But ni jibu. 
So, um, so just to conclude, um, recognising the independence of rights in mental health means shifting from a narrow focus on removing restraints and expanding mental health care to supporting the full inclusion and participation of everyone, including those who, like Amma and Malik, which Lily was, who Lily was talking about, are among the most marginalised. From this perspective, realisation of civil, political, economic, social and cultural rights are equally mental health interventions, as Faraz Mohammed recently argued. These efforts on behalf of mental health workers in Ghana reflect the ways in which a rights-based approach to mental health means going beyond breaking the chains and providing medical treatment to addressing social and community inclusion. And yet such efforts might not immediately be acknowledged as having equal status as formal mental health interventions. They largely take place off the radar, outside usual working hours and beyond the auditing of health service delivery. They rely on unpaid physical and emotional labour. These interventions are embedded in deeply held social ideals of obligation and responsibility, often inspired by religious values as with as God. Who, such as loving your neighbour as yourself. This grounding in social norms and relationships is in part a strength. Their informality enables them to be improvisational and flexible in responding swiftly to particular needs. And yet it's hard to claim that such efforts alone can ensure the rights of people with mental health conditions in Ghana or, or indeed anywhere else. Dependence on charitable donations of others ultimately reinforces inequality and potentially can undermine rights. If Ghana and other countries are to build a truly inclusive society, meeting such rights can't be left to the compassionate response of a few shining mental health workers who we've introduced you to here, but must be the shared commitment of governments, institutions and communities. So thank you very much everyone for listening and we really look forward to your questions and comments. Um, for more information, you can go to the link at movement.org. Thank you so much, Ursula and Lily, for sharing with us. And I think we have one question that's related to your conclusion. So I'm going to read it to you. So thank you for your presentation from Philip F. Young. Thank you for your presentations. The sacrifices of philanthropists are highly appreciated. But does government show any interest in these mental health care issues? Does it lack the funds with which to get involved or is just administratively negligent? So I think that's one question that many are having. Uh, so what's the role of the government here? Lily, do you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, I, I think it is probably both in the sense that the, the government does have some funding for mental health, but it really isn't enough. And as Ursula explained, that mental health is very often receiving the smallest bit of the pie when it comes to healthcare funding. There is no available ring fence funding at the moment. 
But then it's also important to recognize that in the last few years, there has been such a tremendous transformation in the work of community mental health in Ghana. Um, since the establishment of the Mental Health Authority, we have seen changes, we have seen improvements, but it isn't what we need it to be yet. There's still a lot that is outstanding. There's still a lot that we are not, we are, we are not able to provide for persons. And, and that makes the people who are vulnerable, the plight of the people who are vulnerable, even more difficult. And it usually um, results in the onus falling on community mental health workers, like those we have seen there, to, to sacrifice, to go beyond the mandate, as we were saying, to, to put in personal finances sometimes, or their own resources, make alliances that then um, they can draw on in order to support what is left outstanding. So the, the governments are playing a role, um, but perhaps this is the case in most <laughs> low middle income countries. There's just not enough money being put into mental health care at the moment. Yeah, it seems like Ghana is doing, compared to other countries, that would be my next question, like how does Ghana compare to other countries? If you have the research on that, it seems like they're doing a lot, even though it might not be enough. Yeah. 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 Will you take this one, Ursula, or shall I? <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy to say that. I mean, it's very interesting because I'm actually um, working in community mental health myself in, in the UK at the moment, part, part, part of the time. And it's really striking to, to make some comparisons, even from within a high income country, some of the same issues come up. Um, but it, it's interesting in the West African region, Ghana really has been uh, a real pioneer in community mental health. And it, it's really quite striking. And I think um, it's, it's a combination of factors, I think, in relation to, as Lily mentioned, the very strong um, public health um, commitments in, 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 in countries like Ghana. Because, uh, I mean, we've seen that in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic as well. This, um, you know, managing infectious diseases involves community outreach, sensitization of communities, um, and all of these um, track and trace, which is the thing that we've not been doing very well in my country at the moment. Um, and all of these skills are, are, are ones that mental health workers have been able to take up and put to use in their, in their role. So going door to door, literally going to the doorstep of family homes, finding people, many of these people who are in chains. Some of them are in family homes in behind closed doors and until community mental health, health workers started going there they were they were literally invisible nobody knew they were there um, and we met one of these young men who had been locked up in a room and um, the team went there engaged with the family uh, you know he wasn't being fed properly uh, and they 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 um, you know um, started treating him and, and uh, he was able to to, to be more integrated into the family. So, um, so yeah, Ghana really, uh, if you look on any charts, Ghana really has, has done quite an ex exceptional job in expanding community mental health care. There's still a long way to go, of course. And I do, I would plead if anyone with influence in the government is listening, yes. um, you know, I, I would plead for more funds for community mental health uh, in particular, because uh, because it, it does happen that uh, institutions tend to swallow most of the funding uh, and that as I, as I explained has a long uh, history going back to of course colonial uh, policies but yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Lavina looks like you want to talk. If, did you raise your hand? She's muted. Lavina you're muted. Okay, we're gonna come back. Uh, we have another question here. Okay, so Andy Tamia has a question. Mentally ill persons are read as spiritual in most African traditional traditions. Does this understanding still exist in Ghana? If yes, how is it marshaled in various communities? Whether or not they're still seen as, as, as having spiritual conditions, is that the question? So they say mentally ill persons are read, they're considered as spiritual as, in traditions. Okay, so there are still beliefs about spiritual causes for mental illness. Um, 
and and it's from our our experiences over the years it, it, i think it's a, it's usually not an either or situation um you will find that there are many people particularly for those who suffer from severe mental health issues who have tried i should say getting help through biomedical facilities um, Ursula has a really fascinating paper saying, I want the one that will make me well and not make me ill again. And so there are issues about um, beliefs in whether or not the, the psychiatric treatments actually work properly when the illness is considered something that should be curable and not necessarily managed. So there are limits to the kinds of um, antipsychotic uh, treatment medications, for instance, that are available in the country which supports people's notion that if it is not working well, then it must be something that is not physiological. And then the, the spiritual ideas start to also um, take root. So it's in both ways. Some people who obviously believe from the get-go that these are spiritual things that should be managed spiritually, but there are also people who think of it as um, I, I, it's, a, it's a biomedical problem. I have tried healthcare, I've tried the psychiatric um, system my loved one or me myself didn't get well the way I was expecting and therefore it must mean that it's not it's beyond the physical so those ideas do exist okay we have Sarida Liverpool ask thank you so much for the very interesting presentation I have two questions you mentioned first you mentioned you're going to give an update on Amma do you have mm. any recent mm. update beyond her inability to get financial support mm. uh, but ability to open her account also. Okay. Number two, do you have any engagement or experiences demonstrating how you are able to use your work and findings to create some change, either in terms of government program design or even commu community treatment of mentally ill, however small? All right. Shall I take one and take two? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, yes, and by way of an update on AMA, as I said, um, the team had um, intervened or tried to intervene to advocate, sorry, to advocate for her to receive some disability support from the social welfare um, department. But as of now, unfortunately, it didn't work. As I said, she was not approved for that support for a number of reasons, one of which was the absence or the unavailability of a family member who was willing to stand as an advocate and to, to push in the application. Um, this, the, advocates, the advocacy was done by the, the nurses and, and they needed the involvement of the family in order to push that through. Um, as I also showed, the, the um, business that she had started had started to grow. She initially just had one or two bottles of candy that she was selling, but now she's expanded it to a whole tray. She had biscuits and, and gum and other things that she was also selling. So she is doing a bit, um, a bit more business and she, she is operating the account, but there are still some challenges with the family involvement in her care, which the nurses are, are having to, um, to navigate quite carefully. So by way of updates, Ama is, is um, she's not where we were hoping she would be, but as we said, she's a resourceful person and she's, she's um, managing so far. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, for the second question about, um, yeah, how we've been able to, to uh, create any change. That's a really good question because the, the, the question is always what difference does research make, I think. Um, I think, uh, I mean, my my role, I, I'm a, I have a background in anthropology. I'm very much um, interested in how research findings can be used for advocacy, for how we can support activism. And I think that's where we would want to go for, um, next with the film very much about making this available for people to use for their advocacy initiatives, highlighting the importance of this work um, and how mental health fits into the broader health system. Um, so I think that that's still an ongoing um, uh, uh, job for us. Um, but what I'd really like to say in, as well is that actually, you know, I've found in all the years that I've been doing research in Ghana, it's, it's me who's learning from people like um, Madame Regina, from George, from Liberty, from all these other mental health workers. Um, and so, you know, I don't feel necessarily that I have that much to teach, uh, but it's more about learning and thinking together. Um, yeah. 
And um, just to also to add on that, that uh, we're, we had been hoping uh, last year to make some short um, films with people who have lived experiences of mental health issues themselves. Um, and we had it all set up and then suddenly you all know what happened and uh, we weren't able to go ahead with that. But um, we have some, yeah, we have some hopes that perhaps uh, this year we might be able to make those small videos, which we could also use for advocacy where people like Malik can speak for themselves and, and, um, and advocate on their own behalf. And, and can I also add, though, that uh, we've also started to look at ways that we can use the films, the videos, to, you, to, to begin conversations about change within communities and within other institutions. So um, this, this work is very much ongoing, and part of our plans is this engagement that you're talking about. We are, we are looking at how we can engage within local communities about making a change, about uh, talking more openly about the reality of mental health problems in the country and how that needs to change or in what direction we would like it to go. So it's ongoing. Yeah. Very good. Lindy, now you can try unmuting yourself. I think you can do it. Oh, okay. Oh, hello. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Lavina. I'm a psychiatrist. I work in Ghana. Um, I'm currently working with the BHO as a mental health advisor. And in my experience, I can very much relate to the conversation of this evening. Um, we are moving towards community care, but even the care we offer in the community definitely goes beyond um, medication and assessment of uh, well-being. It's far more involving acceptance, making the person functional, connecting them to family, to social support, and ensuring that as part of their recovery, they are comfortable in their own skin and be part of the community and love themselves, whatever the symptoms they have. That's one of the things that we are trying to um, preach through the quality rights initiatives. But a lot of our challenges is also systemic. And as much as you preach rights, if the person doesn't have a place to stay, it's a problem. Yeah. And if the system is not, uh, does not have an uh, alternative of maybe respite service or halfway home, a place for them, then it's not a full, um, they don't get the full benefit of what we are preaching or what we are teaching the rest of the populace but it's a conversation we need to have and we need to start from somewhere as we move towards what is accepted in our culture and what we can do to ensure that we uphold rights but is also culturally acceptable and our people are able to live a free and fulfilling life yeah. thank you and thanks to the uh, panelists for what they've shared with us Thank, Thank you, Lavina. Uh, so, Constance, you ask, you mentioned 2,000 community-based mental health workers throughout the country today. What does Ghana's mental health infrastructure look like now, especially in the north? I feel like we should ask Lavina to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she becomes a panelist now. <laughs> Do you want to take that, Lavina? Because you. Okay, so let me try. <laughs> so in the north, a lot of our human resource predominantly is in the south because uh, from time past, our uh, major hospitals for mental health have been in the south. So there's a lot of congregation of service in the south. But we are gradually trying to shift um, human resource to the north, but is not equivalent to the south. Mm -hmm. Even though there are a lot of mental health units across the country, the care is rudimentary because beyond would say Kumasi, you don't find psychiatrists and sometimes psychologists to augment the care for the 
primary level to um, support the nurses or uh, community mental health officers when they are the cases are beyond them and they need direction, they need support, they need um, input. And so it's work that we are doing to change the narrative. But also, mm. it's not just the fact that um, everybody is down south. There, it's a matter of pull and push factors. People would want to go to a place where they are, they are assured that um, their children will also have a good school, they are comfortable. There's a lot more into that conversation than just yeah. pushing people up north. So we are talking to Ghana <laughs> and other agencies to ensure that we find a way to attract people to the north to also build up structures and to improve care as part of human rights because the people in the north also are um, have a right to specialist care and to have quality care. Thank you. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very good point you make, Levina. If I may quickly just chip in is that um, it, it, it's, it talks about the involvement or the structural support that is available because when, when we do not have um, health workers who, are, when we do not have support for health workers who work in these communities, it's difficult to get them to, to go to these communities or to sustain the work when they do go. We lose a lot of mental health workers to the, this whole idea of brain drain because there's, uh, there's very little support within certain communities. And so up north, there are mental health workers and we've met a few of them like Stephen Asante, who is mentioned in the article that um, Ursula talked about earlier, who is doing some phenomenal work up north. And there are a few others like him, but as Lavina said, certainly not enough partly because there's no support for when they do go there. Accessing some of these communities where people need to be found and to be treated and followed up can be very difficult when there are not enough uh, good access routes and, and there's not enough medication to sustain them or other kinds of psychosocial support that can help. So it's not where we need it to be. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and Abu Ibrahim Rod, it's obvious that community care is the future of mental health care in Ghana. Can it survive? Was that was that Abu? Abu sounded like Abu. Oh, <laughs> Abu. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> Abu is one of the nurses that we also followed up in uh, in in, 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 Ghana, in uh, yeah, Bonnie East. Yeah. Can it survive? Something about if, if it can survive. Community mental health care. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I think it can, but it, lots needs to change if we if if it it if it will. Um, it needs to be transformed quite significantly or improved quite significantly. We've come up a step or two from what it used to be, so we need to keep going up. We need to keep going up until we get the care, as Lavina said. Um, what is quality, but also culturally acceptable? What is um, appropriate for the people? And it it has a lot of work to do to get to where it needs to be but i think it can survive if we take these things into consideration i mean i, th I think i think what what strikes me um you know uh is, is that there is this need to bring the community on board because i don't think community mental health can be just about a few a handful of mental health workers and i think yeah. that's where you know your local government your your um in ghana there they're called the district or municipal assemblies they need to be on board with this. You know, they shouldn't be obstructing access to, to benefits, making sure that people can access social protection programs, um, bringing the police on board, bringing the whole, uh, the, the religious leaders, the traditional leaders, um, the people who run the markets, the people who run the transport yards, everybody needs to be yeah. on board with this because that's the yeah. only way that, that a true community inclusion is gonna happen um so so yeah so i think i think community mental health like health everywhere isn't just about health services it's it's, yeah. it's about a whole it's that's a, a whole community a whole of society approach yeah i was just thinking have there ever been a campaign national campaign for instance uh to the general population about how to treat the mentally ill 
in Ghana or in any other places? Because I know they do a lot of reaching out uh, promotional material on TV in the school, for instance, with aid at less in my country that I know better. Uh, but I'm just thinking about it. Maybe there is this need, like you talk about bringing the community, but so is it felt as an urgency, for instance, like AIDS, for instance, that do you feel that in your research that the, 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 this is viewed as something that deserves, for instance, a national mm. or not? Mm. I mean, I think, I, yeah, sorry, Lily, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I, was, I was just going to say about, you know, there have been some, some very um, strong uh, anti-stigma campaigns. Um, so it, it happens at different levels. So you have like international funding coming to run an anti-stigma campaigns. There's a lot of stuff on social media. Um, and then you have like the kind of initiatives that some of the nurses do, which is like going on the radio uh, and as you know, radio is a major way of getting information uh, to communities in Ghana. So uh, mental health workers go on the radio, do a question, you know, phone in shows. Uh, so there's a lot at that level, but I think that there is a lot more that can be done in that respect. Mm -hmm. well, did you want to add something? No, actually, that's what I was going to say, that there are things that are going on. And, and the urgency that you talk about, I think, on the part of the community mental health nurses, yes, you, so you do see that urgency. They're working hard to make sure that mental health talk is out there, that people are, are talking about, that people are looking at what the needs are, people are seeing the, the work that they're doing in order to encourage change or to encourage transformation. Um, it, with the new the mental health authority these days, we do see some changes, but in terms of the media engagement, it is not as much, except at, for instance, like the level of if they, if they have partnerships with um, some of the mental health nurses who go on radio or TV shows and things like that. Um, yeah, so there is some sort of level of urgency, particularly amongst the health workers, but um, not so much in the ordinary space or the everyday man space. And um, Philip Effion has a question. Mentally challenged females who end up roaming the streets are also often vulnerable to sexual abuse to the point of being pregnant. Can someone comment on this? Yeah. Yes, there are, there are those vulnerabilities that are inherent when, um, when people who are living with mental health issues are on the streets. Um, and, and this was probably part of the, the reasons why George and his team and Abu and his team, they work so hard to, um, to, place, to place such people back with families, to, to be able to house them, to get them off the streets, so to speak. There's a certain level of campaign from once, um, every once in a while where the, uh, the government or the health service does this clean, clean what do they call it, clearing the streets mm. of the homeless, yeah. Those, those campaigns are at a, a sort of different level, but within the communities, when the health workers are, are finding and uh, treating persons who live in the streets who are living with mental health issues, it, it, is, it is, from my understanding, as a way of making sure that they are protected from some of these things that make them vulnerable while they're on the street. So apart from the sexual abuse, there's also, as George mentioned in the clip, there's physical abuse and verbal abuse at, at times as well. Um, so those things are all part of what they are, they are seeking to remove. Yeah. Um, Awa, are there, are there other questions? Because um, I know that um, I think some of our, some of, like, people like George or say, and um, I don't know if Liberty is here, but Abu uh, and, and mm. other nurses that are in our, are, are, are the subjects of, of our work. The, our the champions. <laughs> and I think there are some of them are in the audience. I don't know if they would like to add something about, um, on, on, on to what has been said. Hey, let me, I think, okay. Um, Ibrahim Nikema is uh, one of the nurses who's there. Okay, let me. I see George here as well. Hi, George. Hi, Abu. Who else is there with you? I need to bring Abu. Is Abu here? 
Abu has his hand up from what I can see. Yeah. Try try unmuting yourself. Hi. Hi, Abu. Hi, Abu. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening to you. Good evening. Yeah. Um, concerning the um, the vagrants or the mentally challenged on the streets, like someone mentioned that they are prone to sexual abuses. Um, one thing I, 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 I rep, I've seen here in the Chiman is that it is actually very, very, very easy. And then it doesn't, it doesn't cost much to treat such people. And I, I think I shared one of these testimonies too with uh, Ursula and then I told her what really goes into it. And then um, I worked with my team and then really wanted to see what goes into as far as the medication is concerned. And then and it was as little as 80 Ghana cities to start treating the person. So uh, we started talking to people. And then we realized that people were already waiting to hear some of these things. People are out there willing to support, but it was up to us to come up, to, to, to initiate this. People are ready to listen to us. People are really ready to, to help. And then um, currently I think in, from January to now, I've already treated two vagrants from the streets in Techiman. So uh, we have to talk to the right persons and then we have to talk to the, the, the right people. And then Dr. As Dr. Pobi mentioned that um, the community involvement is very important. Yes, the chief of Bamri, one of the suburbs in Techiman, uh, well, there was this guy that was sleeping outside, whether rain or shine. We went to him and then when we spoke to him, he said yes, but he, did, he didn't know what to do about it. And then just then he gave us a, a room to start the treatment. So currently this guy is staying in the, in the room and then we, we, are, we, are, we start, I think he's, he's doing very, very well responding. So what I would say is that um, uh, all of us, all of them, the mental health fraternity, we should look around us. We shouldn't go far. We should talk to the community. They are really ready to support us. They are. So we should just talk to people in the community and then I think we'll, we'll find a, the, the right answers we need just around us. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Abu. That's so important, yeah. yeah. And I remember um, Madam Regina, the nurse, so she, that's all she said, you start with what you have. Yeah. And I feel that, that that is what we all have to do, really, is to start with what's, what's, what, what resources we have. So, George, the floor is yours. I think George raised his hand. So. I remove somebody else. I think you can un unmute yourself. Hello, George. Hello, George. We can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can now. Thank you. I say here is different from what Abu is saying. Like in France, uh, once, once you, you touch a patient, the patient becomes your property. And that's the one challenge that we have here. Once you touch the uh, uh, client, the, the oh. oh, no. George, we've lost you. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Here, what we do is, once you spot someone walking on the street, we try to uh, treat the person, then hand, hand back the pa patient to the family. Re we try to rehab, like what we saw concerning AMA. But the problem is, once the patient is stabilized, they feel that this patient belongs to you. Mm. So if the patient is, if you want to buy some sanitary, they will refer the patients to you. The medications, they, they refer the patients to you. So up to stands now, 
the 30 mental health nurses we are in the municipality, we are all taking care of about two, two patients. We buy them monthly medications. That's the one change that we have here. But another aspect is that we try to work with the assembly. And it will surprise you that most of them, you don't, you don't really understand mental health. You go to them, and even the last time I pushed to social welfare, they try and they came out and said that no, uh, if you are talking about disability, mental is not part of it. Hmm. So it, it, it took constant fighting for them to recognize that yes, mental is part of disability. So that, that's the other challenge that we are facing here. Now, per, previously we used to treat a lot of vagrants, but because they are, now they have become our property, we are afraid to treat more. And though of 2020, you treated one patient because you treat the patient and instead of the family to continue the treatment, they rather abandon these patients and they are looking at you to take care, to take every responsibility of such patients. And that's the one challenge that we are encountering. Another aspect is, we know these patients, they are being stigmatized. And these are the medication, sometimes they struggle to get it. No one is offering them job. No one is trying to even employ them. And these patients need to buy their monthly medication. How do they get it? And our fear is, look at where we pick attack from. And now if you stop giving medication, this person will go back to streets. So we can do that. The best thing we can do is to try to, the letter that we end, to use them to make sure attacks sustain from relapsing. So this is another big challenge that we are facing. We are facing, and now it's like all the officers, mental health nurses, they are all losing hope. Most of them are diverting, and that's the truth. And I've even said a, a, a question here now. Since what is ongoing, we are not getting resources to do the work we are supposed to do. A time will come, I'm even afraid that the concept of community care will collapse. Because mm -hmm. you do it, no support is coming. You do advocate day in, day out for people to, it's like what we had, the items that you collected from the, our colleagues. People even donate some money to support ATA, people donate, we go to radio, we appeal to public, sometimes people try to support. It's like, sometimes you feel like we are being fed up of what we are doing. The care, mm. the support is not coming. It's not like we are struggling to create our own needs, our own department to make sure people get well. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. It, it is a really big problem. And, and it is a, a dangerous because people get disheartened and then we lose out and a very needed workforce. When you have people who are so passionate about their work starting to become discouraged, then, then we have a lot to worry about and a lot to change. We need the support. Well, thank you so very much. Go ahead, go ahead, Ursula. Yeah, I, I, yes, I mean, I was going to say, I mean, that relates to the question earlier, you know, what should the government be doing? It can't be left to mental health yeah. work to, to alone to 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 bear to carry this these responsibilities because George is right once you have helped someone they can become your responsibility and I know that the nurses are you know use their own mobile phone numbers so they have you know calls day and night and it's, yeah. it's that's not sustainable really yeah. uh, and there is a huge um people will move from mental health to other branches of healthcare. um and we don't, we don't, we really can't afford to be losing people like George, Abu, uh, and the rest of the team. These, these are huge yeah. assets to a country uh, like Ghana. So, um, yeah. Thank you so very much for a very exciting eye on Africa. Because usually we only get to hear from the scholars, but today we get to hear from the people on the field themselves. So we really appreciate that. Thank you, George, Levina, and Abu for, for coming and, and sharing with you. So we, we very much appreciate that. But also thank you to you, Ursula and Lily, uh, for, for coming and, and, and sharing with us. And hopefully, uh, the, 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 we, we, some things, things will change because that's the word. I think things that are being done but we, we need more, not we more. need more. And hopefully, uh, with people like George and Abu and Levita advocating, so we hope things will change. So thank you, thank you again, and thank you to everybody who who came. And see you next Thursday. Thank you for having right, us. Thank, thank you, you so much for having us. Yeah, very welcome. Thank you for coming. All right.